Hello, my name is Kamran Devi Dasi, and Srila Prabhupada accepted me as his disciple in December of 1974. I served in his temples for many years. I was pujari, book distributor, seamstress, cook, kitchen manager. I taught in the Gurukula, ashram, and academics, and I worked in curriculum development. And I served in the area of cow protection, which actually is the most dear to my heart. After some time being removed from temple life and feeling a little bit lost, I was asking Srila Prabhupada in prayer, I'm not working in your temples. I'm not taking care of the deities. I'm not cooking. I'm not going out on Sankirtan. What is my service? And Srila Prabhupada replied to me very strongly, the second generation is your service. So he had given me uh, an instruction and a confirmation. So I've put together a short autobiographical video series about my service to Srila Prabhupada and about my professional practice because people have asked. And I'm choosing to begin this series by addressing the rumors and the falsehoods that have been spread about me and my practice amongst the devotees for many years. This will save some of you the effort of writing uninformed comments and spare others from having to read them. Actually, I think I'm going to disable comments from this series, and I'm just tired of being maligned by those that I formerly regarded as dear family members. So if someone would like to be in touch with me, we have contact forms on purelyprabhupad.com, purelyprabhupad.org, and my professional website, workofanangel.com. So in regard to the second generation of devotees, it's not that everyone wants what I can offer, nor do I have an interest in those who believe that their inheritance is the organization and that they're meant to be the leaders and the directors of it as time goes on. I'm meant to work with those who want to inherit the mission of Srila Prabhupada, which I'm forced to differentiate from the organization of ISKCON. I want to work with those who want to be torchbearers, who want to be placeholders, for the upcoming generations of pure souls to carry forth the dynamic preaching outreach of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I have a natural health care and energy healing practice that I started in 1994. I have an international practice with many satisfied clients and enough worldly credentials to fill a letterhead. I have worked with many people who have been ill or dysfunctional for many years and for whom the medical industry, the medical profession, could offer no solution, and I've had very good results with them. The results came, though, when the underlying old belief systems and trauma patterns began to release. I can't claim 100% success, but neither can any practitioner. I have no need to advertise. The word of mouth referrals are excellent. Krishna owns my appointment book. It's all under his direction. I have no I have non-devotee clients, I have devotee clients who are very satisfied. And some devotees have chosen to unduly and dishonestly criticize my work and spread falsehoods to suit their own agenda. I'm addressing these things not in a mood of defense, but to offer some preliminary clarification. Of the four animal propensities, defending is the strongest, but I have no personal need to defend anything. I'm covered in imperfections, 
as is any soul in this world. Even the greatest Mahabhagva, out of his or her great humility, will not claim to be free of imperfections, so I certainly can't make that claim. For those of you who started the falsehoods, I know who you are. My goal is not to reveal names, and I can only ask, of what are you so afraid that you have to propagate these things to try to discredit me and keep the devotees from hearing what I can offer? And for those of you who've heard the lies, believe them, or spread them, do your own research. Trace the falsehoods back to their source. Make your own decisions if you feel the need. Don't inadvertently prevent others who might benefit from my work or insights to shy away. ISKCON has become gossip central. Please don't participate. It compromises the devotional atmosphere. So the falsehoods seem to involve three main things. The daughter of one very dear god brother and god sister who had a medical emergency many years ago. A young man in West Virginia who was very mentally unstable and also non-compliant with my professional direct directions. And that in general, I plant false memories in people's heads. So let's address these. So there was a young devotee lady in Europe who was having a very serious medical emer emergency. Her parents were trying to get proper care for her. And one of my clients wrote to her suggesting my services. And the person who wrote to this young girl didn't know that my services were inappropriate for her considering the acute, life-threatening nature of the complaint. However, my name became involved in a very negative way. What was spread was that this young lady was a client of mine, and if she had listened to my counsel, she would have been dead. Essentially, that I almost killed a client. So I had an email correspondence with her father, and I saved that. And I would like to share that correspondence with you. I've removed the name of this person and any personal uh, health information for confidentiality purposes. So I emailed this god brother of mine. This was several years ago, um, July 18th, 2013. And on the subject line, I wrote a concern. So I wrote, Dear Prabhu, Please accept my obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I hope that you're doing well. It was nice to get your association recently. I need to address a concern. I have heard from several sources that you said that I advise that your daughter did not need medical care for her recent life-threatening illness. There is no basis, in fact, for that. I was never consulted by you, your wife, or your daughter herself on the issue of her emergency. She was not my client during this episode. I was asked by you if I could schedule her for some emotional energetic support, and as you know, I was not able to fit her into my schedule and suggested that a friend of hers who also does this work might be a suitable person for that type of input. Even if I had been approached by your family, I would not have been involved for several reasons, the first and most important being that she had a medical condition, and I am not a medical practitioner. Even if I had been qualified in that way to offer natural support to her, she was in Europe, I was in Florida, and even if we were closer, she would have needed support, care, and monitoring that is beyond my scope to offer. It was an emergency, and she needed emergency care. That is the purpose of the medical profession, and that is, even on an esoteric level, what she needed to experience. While it is true that natural methods have reversed many serious health issues, there has to be consideration that it takes a longer time than medical means, and that natural support methods 
may have to be intensively applied to get the results that one wants. In other words, not just taking a few herbal capsules a day. If natural methods can be applied in a given circumstance and a healthy lifestyle and diet is adopted, then the results can be, a very, can be very effective and long-lasting. But again, an emergency is an emergency and must be dealt with appropriately. As I was misrepresented, your claims may also have been misrepresented. So I am addressing this now because whatever the rumors are, they are costing me clients. On a devotional level, who cares? Reputation is a hindrance. But I also have a need to earn a living, and this game of telephone, or whatever it is, is interfering with client flow. Thank you for your attention, and I am glad that the medical procedure went well for your daughter. I hope she is recovering well. Thank you for your inspirational service to Srila Prabhupada, your servant, Kamrad Devi Dasi. And so the next day, oh my god brother replied to me, Dear Kamra Mataji, please accept my respectful obeisances. All glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for your note of concern and inquiry about my health. Actually, the problem has cleared up 90% and will probably be completely gone in a month or so. I am slowly coming back to my normal health and greatly appreciate your time and attention to my condition. About your concern, it probably came from a letter from my daughter's friend to my daughter. In my daughter's case, there was no right or wrong. We only tried to gather as much information as possible about her condition and then make an intelligent decision. I fully appreciate your understanding of treating medical emergencies at just that, and that is indeed what she had. After the doctor performed the necessary surgery, he said that it was there was a lot of inflammation and infection, and she must have suffered a lot. A more holistic approach, as my daughter's friend suggested, may have worked, but we will never know. I am sorry some people have chosen to interpret her opinion in a negative light, but you know how negative kata has a life of its own, and also how it eventually, sooner the better, dies. In the meantime, we apologize for any fault on our part, hoping you are well, with gratitude, your servant. Das. So I replied him the next day, Dear Prabhu, please accept my obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for letting me know what may have started the, the misunderstanding. I can see that what wrote to her, wrote to your daughter, maybe not recalling the full context of what I had said to her, as I wrote to you in the first email, added to the confusion around an already stressful situation. Your family gave proper consideration without much time to spare, and I'm glad it worked out well. And he replied me, Thank you, Kamra Mataji, for your understanding, hoping all is going well with you, your servant. So that was the email exchange with my godbrother regarding his daughter, who I was accused of um, nearly k killing, and she wasn't even a client of mine. So the next rumor was the mentally unstable young man in West Virginia. And I really didn't have a good feeling about accepting him as a client, except that the GBC specifically asked me to try to help him. And it was probably the only time in my professional career that I took a client overriding my own inner sense not to. And I knew it was going to be very iffy. I was working with him by phone for some time, and there was improvement as long as he stayed on his supplements. I had him come stay in North Carolina so I could work with him in person daily. And when he would come to my home office, I had to hide every sharp object when he came in for his appointments. He was definitely unstable. He was a danger to himself and to others. 
and the main thing was that he was non-compliant with his supplements for financial and other reasons. He was barely taking half of what I recommended and sometimes wasn't taking it at all. I hardly got paid for taking care of him, but I did it because the request had come directly from the GDC. When I saw that there was really nothing I could do, I contacted Bhakta Tirta Swami in Gita Nagari because he and that boy had a long-term relationship. And um, Maharaj agreed to personally take care of this boy if I could deliver him to him in Gita Nagari. So my husband and I drove him up there. I canceled a week's worth of clients. That trip cost me at least $1,000, and this was um, over 20 years ago. So during the drive, I had to keep the child locks on the car doors so that this boy didn't jump out onto the highway. And um, it seems he left Gita Nagari, and sometime later on, he was found in some city unclothed and wandering the streets or some bus station or something. And I got the blame for his noncompliance and the disastrous outcome and word spread all over the place. Now, as far as planting false memories in people's heads, I'm not that powerful. Devotees would sometimes ask, how come everyone who goes to see Kamra all of a sudden starts remembering horrible things. Well, maybe these things really happened, and those clients came to me by Krishna's arrangement so they could be set free from the trauma patterns and do their service. I simply facilitate people in their own service. People who have been violated usually feel safe with me, and the old stored issues may come to the surface in that environment. Unpalatable as it is, this stuff does happen, and it has permeated every organization in the world. But false memories? No, even I would have had a hard time believing some of the stuff that my clients came up with if it hadn't also happened to me. And as a professional, it's not my duty to believe or not to believe, but to facilitate the process of the uncovering of the soul for my clients. Sessions are more often than not quite silent, and many clients have come and taken facilitation and not said a word in the session about what was coming up for them. There may have been some emotional release, but my service is to facilitate them, not always to just know what's going on. So things would come up for them, and then I would hear third hand that when such and such was with me, they remembered such a thing and, you know, were processed, whatever. And I can honestly say I had no idea what they were processing or what their recall process was. So I don't know what else the devotees have said about me other than that I'm a witch. Um, like, big deal. I don't care. But on the basis of the falsehoods that have been spread, I've heard that prominent devotees have told prospective clients not to seek my counsel, that my services are a disturbance to the community, and to go to anyone other than Kamra for health care consultation. I heard from one client who recommended me to a devotee friend for care for her child. Then the lady said to my client, I would never take my child to her. I've heard such terrible things. So I don't know this person. I've never spoken to her. I wouldn't recognize her if I ran, in, ran into her on the street. And I would just sit in total amazement sometimes. There were other times I ran into devotees in the stores, and they turned their backs on me and walked away. And all I could wonder was, what was the latest nonsense that was being spread? I stopped going to the local springs for that reason. I didn't want the discomfort of running into anybody. 
I even heard from several devotees that one GBC member, the same one who asked me to work with that mentally unstable young man in West Virginia, that this same GBC was telling temple presidents not to invite me or welcome me to their temples or their communities for any reason. And all I can feel is, uh, wow, I must be onto something really, really good. And I don't believe for a second that these organizational authorities are so pure and so innocent that there is not some hidden motive. Several years ago, one of my devotee clients started a blog site called PrayLikePralad.com. The site is still active, and it's more representative of when we still thought that some serious issues within the organization could be taken care of by addressing them within the ISKCON authority system. I had written some articles on there. There was a video of one young lady, Jala Muki Dasi, making a very courageous presentation in Sri Mayapur Dham. And one devotee had posted on that site some links to information on certain types of abuse. Within days of that site going up, one sannyasi in Europe criticized me throughout his own that I was instilling false memories in people's heads and defamed one of my best friends as being insane and ghostly haunted. He had never met me or my friend. So he sent warnings about me to his friends in the U.S. And I got a call from um, a European client who asked me what was going on that my name was mud there, that I was being defamed all through the European temples also. So all I can wonder is what skeletons these people have in their closets that they are so threatened by me and would rather chum with the perpetrators of heinous crimes than write the organization to a standard of purity that would more properly represent Srila Prabhupada. For me, I've had to step out. I have other work to do. And I'm only addressing the devotee audience here for their own possible benefit and so that I'm not bothered by having to answer ridiculous correspondences as I move forward in my outreach. There's a world out there getting ready to hear absolute truth as presented by Srila Prabhupada. So I've written an essay called Not in His Name that is available on purelyprabhupada.org and was also recorded in video form by Jwalamukhi Devi Dasi and um, it's available on her website, jwalamukhi.com and also on her YouTube channel, Jwalamukhi Dasi. And this essay explains a bit about my own journey in Krishna consciousness. Many devotees have expressed appreciation for what I wrote in that essay. And I think it's very important because Krishna gave the words and the inspiration. So I'm asking you to please look at it, if you will. That's the essay, Not in His Name, available at purelyprabhupada.org. So I've presented what was necessary in this video to clear the way for what I really want to offer, the pure teachings of Srila Prabhupada given in a non-compromising and personal and encouraging way to reach the wounded and disappointed hearts of the inhabitants of this material world. So I also have, um, well, my own and our crew at Purely Prabhupada. We have other videos and essays and podcasts on purelyprabhupada.com, purelyprabhupada.org, purifymylife.com, and then a couple of um, private sites or personal sites from um 
two of my students, floweringvineoftruth.com and dwellamuki.com, that provide basic information about the importance and the practice of devotional service and the Vedic viewpoint on some critical issues in society today. So please take advantage of our small efforts if you find them inspirational. Keep chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, taking only Krishna Prasadam, sanctified foodstuffs, and following the regulative principles of freedom as Prabhupada directed. Thank you.